Well, hello, lovely listeners. Today I have the honour of speaking with Alan Lazaros. Um, can I just ask Alan, is that your real surname? Because when I saw that, I was like, that's a wicked name. Is that actually your surname? So it's not. So that actually, so my birth name is McCorkle. I'm very Irish. Ah. And uh, that's my stepfather's last name. Ah, okay. Right. Okay, cool. Um, so Alan is a CEO and founder and co-host of Next Level University, which is a global top 100 self-improvement podcast that's got more than 800 episodes, puts mine to shame, um, reaching over half a million people in more than 100 countries. Wow, that's um, amazing. Um, you've also got a business studies in, is that, is BS business studies? Uh, Bachelor of Science. My, yeah, I was thinking that's not right. Um, in computer engineering, right, so you're a logical guy as well. Mm -hmm. And um, you're a professional speaker and also a business coach and consultant. And you specialize in helping businesses maximize their growth, impact and profitability online. Okay, so it's online stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I'm sorry that, um, you know, in your bio, you've put you lost your father at the age of two, um, who sadly passed away in a car accident. That must have been horrific. Um, but also at the age 26, you almost had a nearly fate. You, well, you were in a nearly fatal car accident yourself. And that was a real pivotal moment for you where you started to question your own life. Fair to say. Um, so you have a book as well, which is the top five regrets of the Oh No, no, no. Sorry. No, you don't. You read um, a book by Bronnie Ware called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. Um, and a TED talk by Tony Robbins, and they, they were really pivotal um, in terms of springboarding you into how your life has, has unfolded. Um, so I'm really keen to hear all of that. And just, well, thank you so much, Alan. I know it's, um, it's early where you are, um, but thank you so much for, for being here today. You are so very welcome. Thank you for having me. And you know, I go on a, a lot of podcasts. I'm very grateful at this point because <clears throat> at one point that wasn't the case. And I always love going on podcasts, especially self-improvement podcasts. But when I saw the title of your podcast, I was super pumped because never settling is very much something that I believe in and that will be apparent. But when I say I believe in it, it's, it's one of the most important things in the world. I was taught from a very young age, one simple lesson that I still believe in deeply today, probably the best lesson I've ever gotten. My mom said this, she said, Alan, you can be a CEO or you can be a farmer. I'm going to love you either way. But if you decide to aim high and go for CEO, you can wake up one day and decide to be a farmer, but it does not work the other way around. When my father passed away, she had two kids and was a single mother and didn't feel like she had a lot of choices. So she said, Alan, aim high and you will have choices. And so thanks to my mom's guidance, I got straight A's in high school, went to one of the best technical colleges in the world. And she was absolutely right aim high, never settle, aim high, and you will have choices for sure. And if you're not aiming high, I'm going to be completely transparent. That is a mistake. Mm -hmm. That just gave me, I call them angel bumps. You know, when you get the, uh, the hair standing on your arms. Um, your mom sounds awesome. Um, yeah. So I'd love to hear more about you, Alan, um, and the listeners would as well, in terms of your backstory, obviously we've alluded a little bit to what happened, but um, let's talk about Alan growing up um, and obviously the impact of your car crash on you as well. But sort of what, you know, who was little Alan? Um, how, are you, how old are you now, Alan? 33. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping 34 is when I hit puberty. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> is that when you can grow a beard? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So if you talk, talk us um, around little Alan and, you know, sort of hopes and aspirations, but what it was like growing up. I mean, I was a single parent and um, nothing as dramatic as what happened for you, but um, it's hard. So uh, it sounds like your mom did an amazing job. So yeah, over to you, just a bit of your backstory uh, and how you got to where you got to right now. So yeah, I'll take you through the whole thing. And um, yeah, little Alan, it's never been framed that way, but I'm grateful <laughs> because yeah, that's, that's exactly where we're going to go. So, so I'm two years old. And as you mentioned in reading my bio, my father passed away when he was 28 years old. And so I have an older sister. She's about three years older than me. 
And so I was raised by two women and my mom and my sister kind of raised me. And I did have a stepfather from age three to 14. That's kind of uh, another story, but I'll never forget when I was seven, my mom taught me that lesson of aiming high CEO and farmer. You can, you know, you can decide to do whatever you want. If you aim high later in life, you'll have choices, aim high and you'll have choices. That's the real thesis. And it's so true. Best lesson I've ever gotten still to this day. But anyway, so fast forward, I'm, I think, 10, and we're driving in her old black BMW. And to my right, there is at the bottom of the hill, the, the school that I went to is called Worcester Polytechnic Institute. It's called WPI. It's sort of like a, a less famous mini MIT, but same caliber. And she said, Alan, your uncle Merle, my uncle Merle at the time was the track and field coach there for 25 years. As a matter of fact, since he passed away, they actually named the, the track uh, Norcross Field, Merle Norcross, my uncle. And so she said, Alan, engineers go there, really smart people go there. You're really smart. Engineers make a lot of money. Making a lot of money will give you choices. You should be an engineer, that type of thing, yeah. which by the way, is not enough to, to make a life choice, but it was enough for me. And so yeah. I was convinced and, and my mom uh, said, you know, aim high, you'll have choices. So she said this, this is an interesting thing, little Alan. I was at the tail end of middle school, eighth grade, and my mom said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a chance on you. And she said, I'm going to let you take eighth grade off if you promise me that you'll get the president's award in high school. Now, eighth grade off doesn't mean I don't go to school because legally I still had to go to school. But up to that point, I was a really good student, A's and B's, mostly A's, honestly. And she said, you, you don't have to try. Don't try. Just have fun. Just go have fun. Just promise me you'll get straight A's in high school. That's when it really matters. That was her belief anyway. Mm -hmm. And so eighth grade, if you look at my academic career, you've got A's, mostly A's, maybe a couple B's. And then you've got like C's and D's, um, mostly C's and D's in eighth grade. And then in ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade, which in this country is high school, mm -hmm. straight A's all A's. I had one B plus. It was an 89 in honors English. I'll never forget it. Miss Desolates. Uh, never took honors English again after that, <laughs> which was a mistake, by the way. I should have actually learned. But in hindsight, that was my goal in high school. Honestly, that was my main focus was just do not get a B, just straight A's. Like it's, I was the quote unquote smart kid, right? The nerd. And so the president's award was, was you have to get a 95 or above GPA out of 100 for every report card for all of high school. And so I did, I have it behind me. Um, wow. I got the president's award and uh, I have a letter behind me signed by George, George Bush, but I got into my dream school. I got into WPI and I went and I did electrical and computer engineering. And then eventually I uh, was at a company called Tyco Safety Products and I was designing circuits behind a desk. And I was like, ah, I love people. I don't know if engineering's for me. So then I went through that sort of mini early life crisis. And I asked some of my mentors what to do. And I went into business. So after that, I got my MBA and then I did a ton of job hopping. And so I worked for Sensata Technologies. I worked for a company called Oz Development. I lived in LA for a time, um, three month period, three month period. And then I came home and then I worked for a couple other companies. I robot, I forget what the other ones were, but then I eventually ended up at a company called Cognex. And each time I was getting paid more, which was really good because engineers are very needed in the world. So I'll just be transparent. It's not hard for an engineer to get a job right now. Um, as a matter of fact, that's the one thing the world, I think, you know, in terms of supply and demand, engineers are very overpaid right now, in my opinion, just because there's so few of us and it's, you know, technology is, is the focus of the economy. So anyways, uh, I job hopped a lot, end up at a company called Cognex. Now I'm an inside sales engineer at a company called Cognex and they do industrial automation equipment. So eventually I get promoted to outside sales. I started a little inside sales team and then I get promoted to outside sales and I'm managing Vermont, Western Massachusetts and Connecticut, mostly Connecticut was my territory. And so I would go to these manufacturing facilities and I would sell these, these industrial cameras where the software would be able to, you know, uh, measure things. So it's quality assurance. And typically in the past, they would have quality assurance of someone actually looking at the water bottle and making sure the cap is on right and that kind of thing. Now it's just like quick, 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 you know, 
pictures. So like imagine a hundred pictures of a water bottle or of water bottles going down a line on a manufacturing line and testing every single one to make sure that everything's perfect. And so I saw this huge issue in the world where industrial automation is increasing exponentially and service jobs are decreasing exponentially, but yet the less educated population, statistically speaking, is increasing exponentially. Because statistically speaking, less educated people tend to have more children and they have them earlier. And so I saw this huge issue in the future. And this is still an issue and it's going to be a big issue where there's a lot of people who need jobs exponentially increasing and the amount of jobs are exponentially decreasing because of technology. Now, luckily entrepreneurial revolution is upon us and you can create jobs now um, through that. And that's really where I shifted. So when I was 26 years old, I'm working at Cognex. I'm up in New Hampshire, with my little cousin. It's Friday night, playing Call of Duty, not doing anything bad. We're not drinking. We're not partying, nothing like that. We want to go to TGI Fridays. My little cousin was 17 at the time. This is back in 2015. We had a really bad winter that year, like obnoxiously bad, where the, the snow banks up in New Hampshire were covering the signs. And so there was a yield sign that I didn't see. I was supposed to yield and didn't. I end up on the wrong side of the road. And I saw in front of me, I looked down at the GPS and I look up the brightest lights I'd ever seen. What I thought was a Mack truck at the time. It looked like a Mack truck to me. Fortunately, it ended up being a lift kitted pickup truck. Like in New Hampshire, there's a lot of pickup trucks with big lift kits. Mm. And I was driving a 2004 Volkswagen Passat. And so I used to call this the tank. It's a very German engineered steel trap of a car. Both airbags did deploy. So fortunately I was okay. Physically we were okay. I hurt my face in the airbag. He hurt his knee um, on the airbag as well, but we were okay. I had that moment where I thought this was a Mack truck. And for me, this is what turned everything around because when you are 10 feet from what you believe to be a Mack truck and you're doing 30 miles an hour and the Mack truck is doing 30 miles an hour, the chances of me surviving that in this little car are, I just didn't expect to survive. I had that moment of this is it. There's no way we survive this. My engineering brain went no chance. We're, we're, we're done. And so if you've never had that moment, of life or death, it really messes with you. And it, it especially messed with me because again, my father passed away when he was 28. Yeah. And so I'm 26 at the time. And I was so rattled by this because I very, I grew up my whole life hearing stories about John and everybody talking about, you know, how he lived. They never talked about how he died. I'm the only one who does really, but it really messed with me. And so physically I was okay, but emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, I was far from okay. I was absolutely questioning everything, you know, who I was, why I did what I did. You know, I, I drank a lot too back then in college and stuff like that. I partied. And so like, I was just questioning my choices, questioning my career, questioning my identity, questioning everything, just so much questioning. And it was so overwhelming. Like if that was it, would I have been proud of the man that I became? If that was it, would I be proud of the way I loved and the way I lived? And so after that, you know, when we succeed, we celebrate, when we fail, we contemplate. It's, it's that sort of thing. Emotional pain. I now realize this. I didn't at the time, all of this is me reflecting on it. I'm 33 now. I was 26 at the time and I didn't know this, but now it's obvious, right? I was filled with regret. And, and, and the reason I was filled with regret is because I was making decisions with low awareness. So everybody could right now listening or watching this, they could think of, okay, think of a decision you made when you were in your teens when I was 16, I made a terrible decision. Okay. Think of that. Think of whatever decision it is. It's like, you would never do that again. Right. And it's like, okay, why? Because you are now aware of the long-term consequences of that decision. And some people try to wish regret away, which I think is a genuinely awful um, mistake because you can learn from regret. Regret is the best teacher. Mm. I think that fulfillment is the soul's recognition of alignment with its highest self. When you are fulfilled, you are in alignment with your calling, your purpose, your mission, whatever that is. Even if you don't know explicitly what it is, when you're fulfilled, right? You, you know you're, you're in alignment. Regret is, is your soul's recognition of misalignment. Regret is like, hey, you know you're better than this. You are outside of alignment with your core aspirations. You're outside of alignment with your core values. You are outside of alignment with what you believe. You are appeasing others. And so in that dark place, 
and you mentioned this in my bio, I found two stars I had never seen before. I have this quote. The stars are always there. You can't see them during the day. Mm. Sometimes it takes the night, the darkness, to see clearly that which you simply couldn't within the light. And, and for me, there were two stars I never would have seen had I not been in that dark place. And I've had many dark places in my life, but this one in particular, I found, what a coincidence, right? I'm in regret and I almost died. And my father did die in a car accident. And I've seen the pictures of his car and my car. They don't look very different. Mm. Typically in my speeches, I'll show that. And I'm in the dark and I'm contemplating. And what a coincidence. I find a book called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. Mm. I almost died and I'm in regret. Not a coincidence. Of course, I'm going to notice that book now, right? And so when these bad things happen, you're going to wake up to something you never saw before. You're going to find a person, a place, a thing, a book, an idea. You're going you're gonna to notice something about life that you didn't notice before. And I believe that that is the one beneficial thing of these quote unquote tragedies and these problems that we feel like we have. So I read a book called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. I've since interviewed her. Her name is Bronnie Ware. We got to interview her, which was so Brilliant. cool. This was like four years later. It was awesome. Wow. And uh, to this day, I have a flashcard in my pocket with all five regrets. The flashcard's actually right over there. So it's not in my pocket. Uh, I just don't want to lie. <laughs> so the number one regret of the dying, she worked in hospice for eight years with the terminally ill. And the number one regret of the dying, she noticed all these patterns of regret. Everyone's saying, I wish, I wish, I wish. They're reflecting on their life. And they're like, I wish, I wish. I wish. And it's the same regrets. So she thought her job was to take care of them. Her real job was to listen and then to bring this book to the world. So the top five regrets of the dying. She has a TED talk, a book, awesome book. Number one regret of the dying. Number one, I wish I had lived a life true to myself and not what others expected of me. I wish I had lived a life true to myself and not what others expected of me. Yeah. Growing up, we just want to fit in. We just want approval so bad. And it's interesting because as an adult, you need to stand out. You should stand out. And what's average, what's normal, what's mediocre, what's common is no longer what I seek. And now I'm so fulfilled because I'm trying to maximize my own potential, my own contribution, my own quality of life based on my own core aspirations, my own core values, my own core beliefs. And that's what shifted for me at 26. After 26, I said, okay, sometimes you don't get to hell yes until you go to hell no. And, and I'm telling you, from that day on, I said, never again will I ever do something because someone else thinks I should forget that. And there's a lot of people who had some very strong opinions about you're going to start a podcast and you're going to be a bodybuilder. And I got made fun of like vehemently for two years. It was really bad um, trying to break away from, from, you know, some of the old habits and people that, that really were toxic in hindsight, genuinely, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, but I did, I, I pushed through, I grew. And now, I mean, again, no, my night, my life's not perfect, but I'll tell you what it is. It is a thousand times better than it was back then. And it really is pretty magnificent. Honestly, I'm like unreasonably fulfilled. It, it It's like, if, if my life now is a 10 in comparison to what used to be a two, I quit drinking. I'm, I'm uh, sober over three years now. Wow. I, it took me five years to quit drinking, but like over the last seven years, I've probably drank like five times tops, which is amazing for me. Cause I grew up in a lot of that. Um, I started a podcast called conversations change lives met up with. So Kevin was my first guest. That's my co-host. Now he was, I was his first guest. He was my first guest. We teamed up. We, we created the hyperconscious podcast because for a while there it was the hyperconscious podcast meets conversations change lives. And that's a terrible title. So <laughs> on the hyperconscious podcast, then 350 episodes in, we rebranded to next level university. And now we're next level university, holistic self-improvement in your pocket every day from anywhere on the planet, completely free health, wealth, and love. You brush your teeth every day. You can also improve every day. And now we are actually heard in 120 countries and a top 100 self-improvement show. And now we have 24 layers of our business model and a 14 person team and hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue and you know, about to surpass 500,000 listens. And now it's all awesome. And I've got 20 clients all over the world for my business coaching and consulting. And so it's awesome. 
but it's been nothing short of a challenging climb, but at least now the climb is on my own terms based on my own calling, based on my own beliefs, core aspirations and core values. And so that's really the, the main lesson here is, you know, if you're doing what you're doing because your dad or your mom or your aunt or your uncle, like I usually say this to people, I'll be quick about this, but I have clients that uh, I said this once I said, you post things on Instagram and on Snapchat that you would never post on Facebook. And they always laugh. They're always like, yeah, crap, that's true. I said, why? Right? Why? Of course, you know why? Because your judgmental relatives are on Facebook. Your judgmental (laughs) parents are on Facebook, right? This is not, if you're out there right now listening or watching, at this point, I've got thousands of hours coaching. Like I've, I just surpassed my thousandth coaching call. So when you're that knee deep in that many people's lives, the patterns emerge you are not the only one afraid of your parents' judgment. Like you're not, everyone struggles with that. And you are not the only one who doesn't want to post that on Facebook because your aunt is critical, right? Um, just, just honestly, just don't, don't, don't do it. I told my team this, I said, if I'm going to be disliked, at least it's going to be for who I really am, you know? <laughs> so um, that's my story. Oh, wow. Um, that's incredible. Um just sitting there listening to you you're so articulate and so um obviously that's why you're a coach as well so clear your message is so clear and um, your passion is so clear and um yeah I'm, I'm yeah just enjoying it up to this point when you were talking about um being out of alignment you know it, it reminded me of a conversation i've been having this morning actually um with a a fellow coach because I'm also a coach and I'm doing a I've been asked to do a talk for a, a room full of female engineers funnily enough and um the reason being so I had a a, a lady on my podcast um a few weeks back and after we'd finished she asked me about me she wanted to know more about me and she's very in she's very into empowering women especially um especially women that feel like they're un, under been left behind not recognized not haven't got the confidence and she's recently um bought an engineering company with her father and her brother and she's just been shocked at the level of you know the bar is down here somewhere these smaller engineering companies probably not so much the larger ones but they don't really invest they're very male top heavy as as i'm sure you can appreciate um, you know, they feel like second class, really, because they have to take time off for maternity or kids or whatever. Um, so she's doing this event and she's asked me to speak. And, and so I've been working through what I want to talk about and, and just what you were talking about in terms of the gap between alignment and your when you're fulfilled, you are in alignment with your higher consciousness. And when you, obviously when you're out of alignment, you feel like shit and, and all the rest of it. And you, and you, know, <laughs> you know you're in the wrong place. Yes. And it's and it's how to. And one of the things we talked about was this self-identity versus your brand image, if you like. And it's like um, what people what how do we put it? What people um, if you ask somebody to name the top three things that come to mind when they think of me, what are those three words? And and likewise, that that can be a real eye opener in terms of right because that isn't me at all and when you compare that with the top three things that that you admire in that person that you admire the most generally speaking those things that you admire in that person are they're obviously they're in with the they're within you because you wouldn't recognize them if they weren't in you but you're not allowing yourself to be those things because of external influences like you were saying about your uncle your auntie your mother your father whatever these these expectations that get put on us from a very young age that that can shape us into a life that is not fulfilling and and it's a shame that some people never really break out of that um but it's people like yourself and and me and and other coaches around the world that are able to show that to people and really have an impact but those people have also got to want to acknowledge that and and have the strength to do that in a work right because not everybody's ready for it either mm-hmm. so yeah i just wanted to reflect on that i was thinking about that while you were talking um so 
I'm intrigued to know how the podcast has got so big. As a podcast host, purely selfish now, um, <laughs> How and and I know that you're in the online space. You you work with businesses that are online. So I'm assuming, and I could be wrong in this, that there's expertise within your company in terms of online marketing and all of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So how did you go from right? He's my first guest. You're his first guest. Join forces, and now all of a sudden you're this power team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I appreciate the question. I'm I'm going to be as I'm, I, my new goal, I have it written on my whiteboard up in the corner with a little star because for me, everything is uh, this true north right here. So I always have like my purpose prayer, my true north. And then I also have themes and chapters in my life. This chapter, the theme of this chapter for me is courage and candor, mm. and courage to be myself and candor to be explicit. We, my explicit truth about how we grew our show, sheer unrelenting, insane work, <laughs> work ethic. So when you hear 900 episodes, right, or about to be 900, it has been absolutely brutal. It has been so unreasonably challenging. Like, it's nice to say like, oh, we're so successful. All right. <laughs> In the first year, we had 52 episodes. We had a total of 1,052 listens. Total. We had three times that in one day last week. Right. I, I wish I had some secret. Okay. We have at this point, some things that will work and help. And, and we do podcast coaching within our business, which is awesome. And yeah. we actually have a production company that we produce now, I believe 19 shows, 19 people shows. But here's what I'll tell you. Kevin and I just outwork everyone. And, there, and there's two of us. And, you know, we have a 24 layer business model and we're not a podcast. You know what I mean? We're, we're, uh, we're intending to be a global hundred million dollar business in the future. And I, and I don't say this to, to be arrogant. I, I just, we never really were a podcast. We, we were all in from the get. This is not like, Hey, let's start a podcast and see how it goes. We, we both quit six figure jobs and went all in. This was our one thing from the beginning. And now we're five years, a little over five years in, and we've had more success in the last year than the previous four years combined. So what did we do differently? Um, we outworked everyone. And when, when you hear an episode a day, as a podcaster, you go, how is that even possible? Yeah. Right. If you're not a podcaster, you have no idea what that means. Yeah. <laughs> if you're a podcaster, you're like, okay, either they're terrible episodes. And they're only <laughs> no, see, they're all over 15 minutes and they're all really well prepared for. I mean, they're, we like prep for these. We aren't just throwing these, these aren't just repurposed things. Right. And so one of the reasons we grew so quickly is just the compound effect of consistency. When you have that many episodes, you're, you're, and you're in that many people's lives and you're coaching and there's two of you and you have a team that's growing. I mean, we chose in advance when you mentioned marketing tactics. I think that was our problem. We aren't good at marketing. Right. I think what you mentioned is, was our problem for a long time is we now have our five brand words that we try to represent. <gasps> Excuse me. Simple is number one, simple reliable is number two professional is number three um high tech we want to be at, we're a software company now we're, we have an app um so high tech and then the last one what was it so simple reliable professional modern and high tech so those are our five brand words but we didn't start there we had a little cartoon avatar it was called the hyperconscious podcast i mean we were winging it we didn't know what the hell we were doing Put it this way, and I'll, and I'll be just explicit about this because I think it's funny. If I was my coach, let's say me now could coach me and Kevin, I would kick our ass. Mm. Oh, my God, you guys are messing up, right? And so it's taken us a really long time, in my opinion. Kevin was so excited. He's like, we had 3,000 listens in one day. And I said, honestly, Kevin, we should be way ahead of that, right? I mean, we've been doing YouTube for two and a half, three years, and we only have like 600 subscribers, right? And I think our content genuinely, I mean, I appreciate the kind words. We're very articulate. Mm. The content itself is, in my opinion, and I've listened to a lot of shows too. So I'm not just saying this. And yes, I'm biased. I believe our content is the best. 
Mm. But our marketing, I mean, we, we're terrible, right? Just we were terrible for so long. And, and it turns out the package actually matters more than the product, which absolutely breaks my heart. Yeah. But it is true. It is true. And so um, we've finally come up on the branding side. We don't do marketing, but we do do branding. And uh, we have this amazing digital artist. Uh, her name is Christina, and she does all our artwork. So if you were to look at my social media now, you'd be like, oh, okay, they, they're the real deal. They're professional. But for a long time, I mean, we were just not taken seriously, mm -hmm. um, understandably in hindsight. So I'm intrigued now. You're not just a podcast, you know, this is not just a podcast. And you've gone into coaching. So the, the podcast has been around five years and is involved evolved into what it is now when did the coaching start did that start at the same time um and and what made you all of a sudden go right I'm gonna coach yeah it's interesting because again 33 connecting the dots looking backwards I didn't know this at the time but I've been coaching my whole life I just didn't I didn't know it yeah. so I think everyone has their nucleus my nucleus is coaching and, and that's been actually hard for me a little bit because I wanted to be a world-renowned speaker and podcaster. And, and I do speak in podcast, of course, right? I'm doing that now. But coaching is where I need to be spending most of my time. It wasn't until we started a little program called Next Level Certified Coaching. So our podcast is Next Level University. And so everything's branded now, luckily. Yeah. Um, next Level, right? Next Level Certified Coaching. And I was coaching these two groups on how to coach. And I remember being like, oh my God, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. <clears throat> because you think of coaching and you think like, oh, it can't be that hard. It's like, okay, well, you know, go to the gym consistently and, and make sure you eat enough. No, 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 no. Coaching is the identity level stuff. There's so much that goes into it. I can't even begin to describe it without like hour long sessions week to week. And so I actually canned that program, got rid of it, decided I don't want to coach on how to coach because Kevin told me, no one's ever going to coach like you do. You were born and bred for this. And I do know that to be true now. Not, not that no one can coach like me, but it's my gift. I think all of us have a Michael Jordan level talent. Like this is my gift. I mean, I, all my clients, I have 20 of them are like playing at a whole other level. And Kevin helped me understand, like, take you out of the equation. Where would those people have been? And when I really did that, I started to go, oh, Okay. One of my clients made a hundred and no, 450 grand in six days. And now I'm coaching his entire team, which is awesome. And then one of my other clients went from six grand a month, to 30 grand a month within three months. And so I think that to answer your original question, how did the coaching come about? We started for free. I started coaching for free. So did Kevin. He had his first client was Jenna. My first client was Amy. Both of them are now on our team so cool this is years and years and years ago this is when we thought the podcast would actually make money and stuff like that right and we now don't advertise anything we only advertise our own products and services and now we have you know a half dozen products and services but again taking you back it was at a necessity so when i left corporate i had a huge nest egg i had like 150 grand he had um some i think 15 or 20 grand or something like that but we ended up in credit card debt trying to bootstrap the podcast and again, we were all in on the podcast and we eventually had to coach out of sheer necessity just to survive. So we started for free. Then eventually it was 50 bucks a week. Then eventually a hundred bucks a week. Now I'm doing 250 bucks a week. And so, and I, with 20 clients, 250 bucks a week, that's well over six figures. And that's actually only, that's a, the smallest portion of our revenue where we're real, really getting revenue. Kevin went all in on podcast coaching. So at first it was me fitness coaching and then him mindset coaching. And then I evolved to peak performance coaching. And then he went to peak performance coaching. And then eventually he went into podcast coaching because he realized that's where his expertise is because um, we were starting to become successful. And when you're that unsuccessful for that long with that many episodes, you really do learn like what works and what doesn't work. And so he went all in on podcast coaching and then I went all in on business coaching. And that's where I really found my genius zone. That's when I, the engineer came back out of me, engineer with my master's in business. And I just started going, oh, okay. Technology, exponential organizations, 21st century. Like that's when I really started to notice, okay, I'm, I've got something different here in terms of my, my engineering brain. Because I told Kev, we have this business model, right? And it's, it's got 24 layers now. And I told Kev, I said, this is the best in the industry. 
And he said, how do you know that? Like, I don't get it. I said, well, this industry doesn't have a ton of engineers and I don't know how I know. I just know that I, I, when I go into a business, for example, I can see their spreadsheets. I can see their p and I can, I, I can see their business model, like Panera, right? Definitely invest in Panera. They're automating. They're going to do wonderful. They've got a great product. I, business has always been like so easy for me for some reason. I went to electrical and computer engineering. And I remember when I went to business school, I was like, I went from signal analysis to like business classes. I mean, it felt so easy to me. And I think number one, it's easier than engineering in general. And number two, I do think it's a genius. So genuinely now in hindsight, I didn't know this for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, numbers, I was the guy who could party, never go to class and then get straight A's in calculus, like all of the calculus classes. And, and I was that obnoxious student who everything just came super easy to, right? And so now I'm really not drinking and I'm, and I'm, I have really good habits and I'm preparing. And so now it just feels like I'm off to the races, which is wonderful. But to answer your original question, we started from the ground up. Yeah. A lot of people are like, oh, know your worth and charge a thousand bucks an hour. It's like, no, absolutely not. No one knows you, right? Tony Robbins should get paid more than me. He's built 40 years worth of a brand. Mm. So he charges 250 grand per call, four sessions, and a percent equity of the upside. I think it's 3%. I should not charge 250 grand. I've never coached before. Mm. Right now, I have thousands of calls and hundreds of speeches and hundreds of teams huddles and, and thousands of podcasts. Of course, now I can charge more. But some people right out of the gate are like, know your value. It's like you've never even coached before. Mm. No, start small and build. I don't like that crap. Like, I, I know some people undervalue themselves, but honestly, some people inflate it too. If you've never coached before, okay. I have over a thousand hours coaching individuals from every industry, every background, every type of business you can think of. Okay. Why should you charge as much as I do if you're a brand new coach? Right. And then they wonder why they don't get clients. Yeah. Okay. My clients that pay a thousand bucks a month, that's like, that's a, that's a mortgage for some people. Mm. Right now, I'm not saying not to increase your price over time. It's a supply and demand curve. Now that I have 20 clients all over the world, of course, raise your price, right? When you have people knocking down the door, you can raise the price. That's how supply and demand economics is supposed to work. Yeah. But to get back to the original question, we started from the absolute ground up. We bootstrapped every day. And I'm telling you, Kevin and I, for our faults, we, we suck at a lot of stuff. Okay. Genuinely, we're, we're really bad at a lot of stuff. We are unreasonably relentless and hardworking. I mean, we've never missed an episode and we went from one, one a week to two a week to three a week to four a week. We jumped to five a week and then jumped all the way to seven a week and we've never missed an episode. And so there's two of us and we just, we are, we are the most, he is, okay, I'll just say this. I'll talk him up, not me. 24, he tracks 24 habits a day, every single day and never misses, never. Okay. He has a hundred percent. Our whole team is tracked on something called peak performance tracking and they all do a daily dozen. I only do a daily dozen. So I have 12 things a day. And then we all have one KPI. He has 24 things a day. I said this, I said, Kev, I think, I think you might track and execute against more positive habits in a day consistently than anyone in history. And he was like, that's so weird to me. And I'm like, I know, but remember, Three and a half years ago, when I said, hey, we should really start tracking our habits, he was like, no, I don't want to do that, right? And we started with five, and he couldn't even do five, right? And so <laughs> now here we are, like years later, it seems all great. It's just, you just start small and you build, and you build. And he's a bodybuilder too, and so, so the work ethic was just there. The dude just grinds. And so honestly, we don't have anything special other than I do think my engineering mind has helped a lot. We're very systems thinkers. And then we just, we just grind an insane amount to the point where people thought we were nuts. I mean, genuinely. No, I don't think anyone thought we'd be successful. Where did you meet him? Kevin? Yeah. So Kevin and I went to, uh, we grew up together. Ah, uh, right. So you Yes, been but we weren't friends. That's the interesting thing. Oh, right. um, he didn't like me. He was pretty insecure and I was um, <laughs> very, very confident. Some would say arrogant. And so we didn't mesh. Mm. Uh, and we both, so he grew up without a father too. So he, his father left when he was a kid. Um, and so we connected on this. I, I, in hindsight, again, this is clear. Kevin and I had, had low self-worth and we both were raised by two women. He was raised by his mom and his Mima. And I was raised by my mom and my older sister. And 
now we are creating a charity called Next Level Hope Foundation for Boys Without Fathers. And so that was the, I think we had a common wound yeah, and we had a common aspiration. So he had a podcast. I was his first guest. I had a podcast. He was my first guest. And it's just been, it's been truly unbelievable. Kev's, Kev's an awesome man and we both are character over everything. So it's just been, it's been really challenging, but it's nice to see a lot of our hard work pay off. Oh, I love that. Um, what's next for you guys then? I mean, obviously you uh, are looking to take over the world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Make it a better place. That's the <laughs> Yeah. So the charity sounds amazing. That's um, because it's so, it's so commonplace. Uh, not just through your tragic circumstances, but, you know, so many broken families, so many fathers that don't step up to the plate, whether it's because they can't, you know, they're not being allowed to, or whether it's because they just choose to leave um, and they can't deal with the responsibilities. Um, it's so commonplace. That's amazing. Um, and so needed. What is the how do you intend to support, you know, what does it look like that charity? So every father's day. So Kevin and I have spent every father's day together ever since we got together with the podcast for five years now, Yeah. because that was the lonely day for us where everyone was with their dads and we mm. just never were. Right. And so what we decided to do is host an event on father's day. And this is the vision. We haven't done this yet. Um, but we have raised money for it, which is awesome. So this, this father's day, we're going to rent out a rec center. Uh, it's a place called the Habitat in Uxbridge, where we grew up. And we're going to bring what we believe to be a character-driven male role model who is sort of famous. Uh, we're not certain who that will be yet, but we're going to bring them. And we're going to have volunteers. And we're going to make a day that is typically sad into a fun team-building, activity-building day where we can really have some one-on-one -on -one contact with these kids and show them what a character-driven male role model is like from a place of healthy masculinity, not toxic masculinity. And I do think that's one of the things that, so Kevin and I didn't know this, but when the law of attraction worked very nicely for us, we, even when we didn't know it. So our listeners, people think would be like, I mean, we're a couple bodybuilders, right? And we thought it would be guys. Mm. Wasn't, uh, it was mostly women in their twenties and thirties and forties who struggle with courage, clarity, and confidence, and who want more fulfillment out of their life, uh, their intimate relationships, and especially their careers. And so we naturally, I mean, we have something called next level nation. It's our little private Facebook group, and it's actually growing quite a bit now, but it's all, I mean, it's mostly women. It's women who are aspiring to greater. And so we're a part of this really beautiful thing where finally women are, are, are able to live the life they want and they're not as suppressed by society as they once were which is unbelievable and on top of that i think we have this unbelievable reverence and respect for women because we were raised by them and we didn't have any toxic masculinity because we didn't have fathers that we looked up to and so it's created this beautiful thing where we're able to and the other thing too and i will say this statistically speaking and and if someone doesn't like this i don't really care because it is true most of my clients are women their ego they have lower egos they're not like they, they, they're more open-minded genuinely, like statistically speaking, it's very clear, right? It's very hard for a guy to take advice from a guy. And it's like, it bothers me. And, and maybe that's me not being assertive enough or whatever, but I just, some of these guys that I try to coach, it's like, it's like, I'd rather beat my head against a, a wall. You know, it's like, why, why'd you even hire me? I don't want to do this. What are we doing here? Right. Yeah. It's like, you want to pretend, you know, more than me or what? Like, cause I'm here for you. And so I, I coach mostly women. I, I resonate with women. And, um, I think statistically speaking, they're open-minded and, and more open-minded anyways. And so anyways, um, I forget what the original question was, but I was oh, the next level hope take, foundation. Yeah. I'm taking yeah. over the world. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. So I, I just, our, our sincere goal, I know this sounds yeah, we want to have the most successful holistic self-improvement podcast in history. And yes, I have a background right now that says the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do with Steve Jobs. And that's the background of my phone as well. And I do have a plaque back here of Steve Jobs as well. And Steve Jobs has been my hero since I was a kid. But at the end of the day, one thing I will say that I'm proud of is that we're just really helping people improve their quality of their life through 
maximizing their own potential and their greatest level of contribution. So my girlfriend and I, we call it the maximization triad. Those are the three things. Number one is, are you maximizing your own unique potential? Number two, are, are you using that potential to contribute to the world in your own unique way, maximizing your, your contribution? And then number three, are you allowing the profitability of that contribution to, to improve the quality of your life? Mm. And so that's the triad. And that's all our podcast is. We're just trying to help people maximize their potential, maximize their greatest level of contribution, and maximize their quality of life. Why? So that they're fulfilled. If there's anything this world needs more of, it is more fulfilled people, not pleasure seeking, not arrogant, not, not everything's totally fine, even though it's really not, but I'm going to pretend it is on social media, but I mean, actually in your real life, fulfilled human beings. And that's why I'm writing my book called optimizing for fulfillment. It's, it's fulfillment's a formula. It really is. It's a formula. We're all unique, but, but we all have principles that, that the human condition imposes upon us. And if you understand those principles and you understand your uniqueness within them, you can create a fulfilling life. There's no question. It's just a matter of understanding the formula and then implementing it consistently and improving over time. Um, but the Next Level Hope Foundation, super excited. Every Father's Day from now on, we will be renting out a rec center. We will be identifying people in the community, boys without fathers, and we will be doubling the size and the impact every single year, just like we're doubling our revenue and doubling our listens. And um, so super exciting. Oh, sounds amazing. Um, so you. Alan, if um, people want to reach out and find out more about you, what, what's, where's the best place for them to go? The podcast. So Next Level University, it's spelt just like it sounds, Next Level University. You can find us on any podcast platform. We are on YouTube. And in the show notes is all my contact information. My email is there. My Instagram is there. My LinkedIn is there. My Facebook is there. Our private Facebook group is there. Between my assistant and I, I have the best assistant ever. Amy, I think you've talked to Amy. Yeah. And she and I, between her and I, we get back to everyone. I don't know if that will always be the case, but I do know right now we genuinely get back to everyone. And I would be lying if I said I wasn't super overwhelmed at this point. So I don't know if that will always be the case, but please reach out if this resonated at very least, you know, I do believe the podcast will help you. We have group coaching programs. We have one-on-one -on -one coaching programs. We have relationship coaching programs, my girlfriend and I. So there's something for you if you want to get to the next level. And that's really, that's really it. Yeah. Cool. And um, I always like to finish these conversations with anything that you feel drawn to share um, with the listeners, anything at all. The, the, I appreciate that. What do I, I always feel drawn to share the same thing. And it's, it goes back to the original point, which is what my mom taught me, which is aim high. And again, this is the, the don't settle, you know, this is the thing. Okay. People say life is about the journey, but it's shallow thinking. And I want to explain it. Okay. The destination you choose in advance dictates the journey. So driving from Boston to Worcester, which is an hour long drive is a very different journey than Boston to LA. When I was 22, 23, I drove from Boston to LA and I lived in LA for like three months. That journey was epic. Oh, it was epic. It was unbelievable. The Rockies, right? I stopped in most of the capital cities. We stopped in Vegas. How long did that take? <laughs> What'd you say? How long did it take? Uh, four and a half days. We cranked. <laughs> we cranked. Uh, it was like five days. And we ruined his transmission in the Rockies, which uh, <laughs> you don't want to do cruise control in the Rocky Mountains. Don't do that. Bad yeah. idea. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, so if you think about the destination of LA, Boston to LA, see that journey is very different than Boston to 30 minutes south of Boston. And so people say life is about the journey, but I think they're making a mistake. And here's why, because if you take that at face value and yeah, that looks good on a fortune cookie, but it's not true in terms of if you aim high, your life will be better. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to give an example. Let's say you want to run a five minute mile. Okay. It's ridiculously challenging to run a five minute mile. Okay. I've never personally run one, but I've run a six minute mile and I can only imagine. Right. Okay. That one goal to run a five minute mile 
makes you eat better, makes you, you probably have to sleep better. You obviously have to exercise more. Your sex life is probably better. Your cardiovascular health has to get better. You probably attract more athletes and people that are, that are fulfilled. Um, you probably have read some books about how to be a better runner or cardiovascular health or things like that. You see the one goal has forced you to become so much more. And when you become more, you can give more. I'm 33 years old. I am more capable at 33 than I was at 32, than I was at 30, than I was at 24. Like you think I'm really articulate. I really appreciate it. I have thousands of episodes, right? Between 200 speeches plus a thousand coaching calls, you know, I think it's like 950 plus podcasts between ours and others. And then all the team huddles. I mean, I'm on the phone with the team all the time. Of course, I'm going to be good at communicating, right? This was a natural gift. This was built over years and years and years and years and years of perfect, uh, prep, rep, re reflect, perfect, prep, rep, reflect, perfect, prepare, do the rep, reflect on it, and then perfect it. So I used to say, um, we had an um jar. I used to have to put dollars in the um jar because I used um too much in my filler words, right? Now it's basically or like or you know, literally or genuinely, right? I have all these filler words that I'm trying to get rid of. It's all by design. None of it is luck. None of it is, it's just going to work out. If you've ever been to a high school reunion, it's not just going to work out. I'm, I'm sorry to say it's not. My last piece of advice is this. Your future is not going to be bright by default. It's not. Things decay over time. If you don't use your body, what happens to it? If you don't take care of your home, what's happened to it? I'm a homeowner now. If you don't take care of it, it will go to shit. <laughs> okay, that's how the universe works. But if you improve your home every day, if you improve your body every day, if you improve your relationship every day, if you improve your career every day, I'm telling you, your future will be bright, but not by default, by design. Life is about choices. Choose a destination that is high, aim high, and work hard every day to get there. Ready? Here's the kicker. Even if you never get there, your life will be 10 times better. Yeah. And that's the goal is to have a higher quality of life. People with low goals, if you don't want much, you don't have to become much. You got to be very careful of taking advice from people like that. Yeah. That was perfect. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. <laughs> it's been an absolute joy to meet you, Alan. Um, I can only imagine how much pride comes out of your mom's heart every time she's in your space. So thank you thank you mel i really appreciate those kind words and i hope i hope that my mom is proud yeah i know i know that she is yeah she she was watching man in the arena uh the tom brady documentary and she's she said she's like this reminds me so much of you that's very sweet um, and then one of my cousins said the same thing without her even saying it so i was like okay that's a cool compliment <laughs> right so yeah. thank you mel yeah thank you adam